thank you for all those who have a thirst for knowing you better and thirst for knowing these things, willing to stay into an afternoon program. We pray a blessing upon each one. Be with our speaker today. Thank you for how you've blessed him and used him in so many places and right here in our own community as well. So be with us now, we ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay. You may be seated. Thank you, Pastor. Welcome back, everyone. You, you know, I got to say, you guys are the quietest crowd. You're so quiet and polite. Oh, well, you should see. Now, now I've got some backup. She's not quiet. These are friends um, from the Valley Center Church, and she certainly knows how to do the call and response. <laughs> she'll, she'll come in with those amens and the hallelujahs. There you go. Well, I'm happy to be back with you all. Let's get... Uh, da, da. Yeah, there we go. So this will be familiar to some. Uh, this is a presentation that I do that's based on the television show that I have called From Sickness to Health. From Sickness to Health. How to help people go from a life of sickness to a life of health. And um, I really enjoyed... I enjoy this presentation because it's on the heart, the heart. The heart is an amazing, amazing, amazing organ, isn't it? Do you appreciate your heart? Do you love your heart as much as your heart loves you? Huh? The heart is an amazing, amazing organ, and we're going to learn about that as we get started here. I'm thankful, so thankful for... Uh, the experience we had at the 11 o'clock hour. Um, whenever I'm sharing the information and I see, like my sister here, there are people who, in the audience who you kind of focus your attention on, who you just see them getting it. And you see, as the pastor just mentioned, your wheels are turning. The transformation is taking place. And I enjoy that because, you know, what is it that would cause a man to travel here and there and everywhere and away from his family and, you know, and suffer sickness. You, you, you may have noticed that I look like I got into a fight here, right? Didn't get into a fight. This is a, a gift from Haiti. Something bit me. Yeah. And, um, but as I see it, I say if Christ could wear a crown of thorns, if he could have nails in his hands and his feet, a spear in his side, then I can suffer some bed bug bites. <laughs> right? Paul says, I count it all gain. I count it all gain. So whatever we suffer, we suffer for his sake. So I don't mind suffering for him, for all that he's done for me. I'm going to say a word of prayer as we get started, okay? Loving Father, thank you so much for all that you do and have done for us. And we just ask that you'll bless us now. Bless those who have come to hear. I thank you for the things that we're learning and the transformation that is taking place. Not to become the, those who have the best diet, but those who have the best experience with you. And this is our continued prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So, from sickness to health when hearts attack. What is disease? Isn't that amazing? She says, it's an effort of nature to get rid of something bad in you. I'm having that experience. <laughs> but it is really, truly amazing. My sister Octavia, is it Octavia? How's that A? Is it Octavia with the long A? Octavia and I were talking over lunch, um, and we were talking about all manner of things, and I enjoyed the conversation. She's a very logical thinker, and um, I just enjoy talking about the whole idea of the Christian experience. Uh, she's not a Christian. You don't mind me telling people that. She's not, but she's here, and she's learning about health. She has a passion for health. Um, and 
she has been learning some new things and she had a lot of questions and we got to talking about different religions and we talked about um, why I've chosen because I didn't grow up as a Christian um, I became a Christian I didn't like Christians back in those days but it was once I began to study prophecy that it convinced me of the trueness of the Word of God and then I was learning at the exact same time prophecy and health prophecy and health and it just opened up a whole world to me really it did but we were talking about I asked her as she practices a different faith and I asked her about sin what do you do with the sin problem and of course she talked about the mor morality of things and and that was a good place to start don't think that I've gotten off the health topic you're still with me right okay good good because as I talk about sickness and disease and specifically heart disease I need to sort of lay this groundwork because it's so appropriate in our understanding so I asked her about sin and she she gave a good response a logical response she said it's a bad thing right and I said well what does sin come from do you know what the Bible says about or how it defines sin do you know how it defines sin how does it define sin missing God's mark that's like transgression because it is in first John where it says that sin is the transgression of the law so how do you know something is a sin it goes against a law right it misses the mark of the standard that is set by the law when you drive your car and you go through a red light what have you just done you broke the law was it a sin <laughs> In the eyes of the municipality, yes, it was a sin. And they'll give you a nice ticket to go with that, right? But you transgressed a law. Now, is the law there to keep you from having fun driving through red lights? Why is the law there? It's protective, isn't it? It's for your safety, isn't it? It's there whether you like it or not. You know, red, maybe a red light is a little too confining and a little too radical of an example. Maybe we should just say a stop light, a stop sign. That works better for you, and I know it works better for you because none of you stop when you go to a stop sign. <laughs> not one of you. Unless you do the California roll. And I've driven with at least one or two of you in this audience and I know by experience I'm not looking at anybody in particular <laughs> but I know for certain that people don't follow that law now unless there's a police officer who is sitting there and watching oh you come to a complete stop as if you do it all the time <laughs> knowing full well you don't but you stop why because it's the law or you should stop because it's the law the point I'm making here is if you should happen to one day say I'm in such a hurry and I just need to just I cannot really fully stop I even have to stop less than I do this than I normally do and I'm gonna kind of go through it and yet someone comes and t-bones you what have you learned there are consequences to breaking the law there are consequences to breaking the law and the law is there to protect you did you know that there is a law within the human body for what purpose to protect you and one of the things that Octavia and I were talking about was the law of diet what you put into your body it's to follow a law today we talked about how we see Jesus in the seed we see him in the berries we see him in the cruciferous vegetables where we find in that word the root crucify and how even as the gentleman has pointed out that you see that the chlorophyll and the blood hemoglobin are very similar in their chemistry comp um, composition 
you see that they're very similar. And there was a reason for that. All to show you the protective care of a law that's even in food. And what we were talking about is how when you actually eat a in and out hamburger, doesn't have to be in and out It could be Wendy's. It could be McDonald's. It just needs to be a burger. Now, the science shows, the research shows, that when you partake of that high-acid food, a burger is high in acid, along with protein. Now, the human body wants to be acid or alkaline. Which one? Alkaline, right? Homeostasis of the human body is alkaline. And health thrives within an alkaline environment. Sickness thrives in an acid environment. So by design, by design, God's design for you is to remain healthy or sick. Healthy, so your body is in an alkaline state unless you change it through what you choose to eat. Now, as I was saying, when you eat that burger, because of the high acid content of meat, and then if you throw some cheese on it, you've just added more acid because cheese is very acid. And then if you add some bacon on it, you've added more acid, right? And then the bread is not really bread. We talked about that last night. Anybody remember? The whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead, right? So, so that bread is not in, it's, it's not real bread. It's enriched and has a lot of sugar in it. Sugar is acid. So now you've got a acid concoction. Let's just call it a time bomb. You eat into it and then it goes into the body and you say, you know what? It was delicious. Mwah. Loved it. Your body is saying, wait one minute. How are we going to deal with this problem? Well, there's a law. And the law says, in order for that to be properly metabolized, you need calcium. That's what she and I were talking about. So the body goes into the law mode. And law says, get some calcium to buffer the acid to bring it back to homeostasis. So, where's it going to get that calcium from? The bones. 90-some percent of your calcium stores are found in the bones. So, do you know what the law of the body says to do? It doesn't take it. The bones willingly sacrifice. It's calcium. See? You begin to see that the law... It's not a rigid law. It's a law of protection and a law of sacrifice and love right in the human body. It gives up its calcium to buffer so that you can live to tell somebody how good that burger was. You didn't even know it. You didn't even know your body was working things out to keep you alive. Now, see what happens to the excess calcium that has been released, though. See, now is where the consequences come in. One of the things that happens is you end up with bone spurs. Because the calcium's got to go somewhere. See, the body didn't, the law just says, you know what? Mm, release the calcium just to keep them alive. But what to do with the calcium? Does it just let it go anywhere? No, it has to store it somewhere now because it ends up in the bloodstream. So it ends up in bone spurs and you heal. And also, have you ever done a full cardiovascular examination where they give you what is called a calcium score? Where they look to see how much calcium has developed or accumulated in the heart. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You all need to go to the doctor. Go and get a full examination, and they should check to see, because it's very important that you not have so much buildup of calcium in your arteries, because that is the hardening. That's the hardening factor. And that hardness is the thing that when it breaks loose, 
it then can cause a heart attack. But all the body was doing is said, it's in the bloodstream now, so what do we do with it? What do we do with the excess calcium? We send it here, we send it there, mm -hmm. and then with hopes that you'll sit in a seminar, <laughs> hear some information that would help you turn your situation around. And you would hear that disease is not necessarily your biggest enemy, but probably your friend. Because a disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. Right? Is anyone tracking this? You know, this is always the toughest time to give a presentation. You know that, right? Because you all are saying, with one part of your brain, half of your brain is saying, tell it like it is, brother, I hear what you're saying. The other half is saying, man, I just want to lay down on one of these benches. <laughs> if I could just, at the floor, give me anything. I'll take anything right now. Just let me rest my eyes. Give me five minutes. Just give me five. Five minutes is all I need. And I watch the struggle where one brain is saying, I want to hear this. And for some reason, the eyes start to blink when... When you're thinking about it, they blink because you're just like, and then you close your eyes and you really think about it. You're like, I'm really, have you noticed that? You close your eyes and say, that is really a good point he is making. Let me just let my head go down and really think about it. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? I know what your struggle is. I know what you, you'll be better in the afternoon as we go through this. But I know, I know of your struggle. Okay, so disease is an effort. The body is trying to do something, as my sister pointed out. It's trying to help you out. It's trying to get you into the place where you can live. It's making an effort to save you. That's what it's doing. So heart disease, heart disease, as terrible as it is, as the number one thing that we suffer in this country, by the way, the World Health Organization says that cancer will overtake it in just a few years. Just a few years. There will be plenty of people who are sick and dying. And it won't necessarily be because of the thing that we suffer from now. So keep in mind what disease really is. It's God's design through a law to actually save you. Right? The law just as it does in, more, in the moral realm, it's there to point you to something you're doing wrong. Anybody catch that? It's an alarm. It's a wake-up call. Don't hit the snooze button. Too many people hit the snooze button. The law is saying something's wrong. And you say, no, it's not. Something's wrong. No, it's not. And you go through this struggle back and forth. You got an ache. You got a pain. Uh, you know what? It'll go away. It might not. All you have to do is check where you are against the laws. Are you stressed out? That could be your problem. Stress will cause a heart attack. Right? Are you getting enough rest? If you're not getting enough rest, then your body is actually building up fat. Did you know that? You can become obese by not getting enough sleep. Does anyone know why? Kohu? Who said it? What do you mean by that, cortisol? What is cortisol? Cortisol is a stress hormone, isn't it? It's one of the stress hormones, and cortisol is wonderful. Aren't you glad you have cortisol in your body? That your body actually releases cortisol so that in case you are being chased by a bear or a lion, you can either fight it or flight it. Right? It is the fight or fight, flight or fight response that's naturally in us, again, according to the law. Isn't that good? Has anyone here ever been chased by a bear? 
good for you, I have. I'm glad you find that funny. I was in Colorado and I was chased by a bear. It wasn't the most pleasant experience. But because of cortisol, I'm here to tell you the story. I didn't fight the bear. I ran from the bear. And I ran really fast, probably faster than I've ever run in my life. So I'm here to tell the story because of cortisol. Now, here's the problem. When you don't get enough sleep, the body thinks according to the law, something's wrong. The law kicks in and says, release cortisol. See, the body follows a law, including the circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm is our sleep-wake cycle according to night and day. Right now, your body's doing something according to the light that's coming in through your eyes and into your brain. Did you know that? Do you know what your body is producing right now? Sleep hormone? Well, that's the most dose of honesty I've seen in a long time. <laughs> well, you're, you're speaking truth, sister. You're speaking truth. But do you feel good after your meal? Ah, then that's serotonin. Serotonin should make you feel good. Because the light is coming in, and you're probably experiencing satiety, right? And you're feeling pretty good, although your body's not necessarily producing melatonin. The human body's going through a different physiological process right now that's making you sleepy. See, your digestion requires blood. So the blood comes from here and goes here and starts to digest your food. Problem is, your head wants to follow the blood. And that's why it droops. <laughs> See? I love explaining things in the most simple way. That's what's going on. But during daylight hours, you are actually receiving serotonin in your blood. That makes you feel good. You're happy because you didn't feel it as much when you woke up this morning because it was kind of rainy a little bit. Yeah? Then the sun came out and you're like, all right. Right? That's serotonin. But when that sun starts to set, when it starts to go down, that serotonin synthesizes and then it synthesizes with melatonin, melatonin and melatonin starts to secrete and then you start to wind down. Right? And when it gets completely dark, go to bed. That's what your body's saying do according to the law. Now, you don't do that. The body doesn't distinguish between you're just up on Facebook or you're running from a bear. Doesn't make the distinction. Just says, you know what? A bear must be in the room. Release cortisol. And then when you don't start running, if you don't start burning that energy, the body has to do something with that, that, uh, that what kind of hormone am I talking about? Cortisol. It has to do something with it. So guess what the body does? Most people don't know this. This is so powerful to me. Do you know what it does? It stores it as fat. Why? Because the law is protective. The law says grab that cortisol, which is great if you're running or fighting, but if it's not, if the body's not burning it, it can be very hazardous to the human body. So what will protect the body? Wrapping it all up in fat and then storing it. And then the next thing you know, you don't go to bed for a few days, a few weeks, few months, staying up late. Where did all this weight come from? I'm a vegan. You're a vegan who doesn't get enough sleep. Are you understanding the law of the body and how it's protective, designed to keep you alive, right? Sunshine is another thing you need every day. Nutrition, obviously, and as we look at exercise, water, all these things, but as we look at heart disease, as we look at heart disease, we see that nutrition plays such a vital role. Now, skipping, skipping, skipping. Now, well, give me a second. That's what we talked about last night. Ah.
Ah, there we go. So, when hearts attack, see, most people believe that their heart is actually attacking them. Oh, they really do. Talk to people on the street, and we've done it. Man on the street, take a microphone, ask people about heart attacks. They say, oh, it's when the heart, you know, just out of nowhere, out of the blue, just decide it's going to attack you. You'd be amazed what people really believe. So, we have found, not my best picture, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to skip the audio, I'll just talk. Okay. But I do need audio for this one. So if you can help me out there, appreciate it, Brandon. Okay, so I'm going to show you someone. She doesn't have heart disease. She was found in a, um, a wonderful documentary, this woman, Jane Chapman. Now she's, can you see her age there? She's 61 years of age. And can you imagine that? I'm 54 next month. 54, and that's what? How many years from, seven years from 61? Yeah? I can't imagine getting to 61 and having this as my way of life. But this, as you see her coming through that doorway, this was her condition. Now, I want you to hear her story. And I share her story with you to encourage us. To encourage us, because somewhere along the way, Jane Chapman was working against the law of her body, and it produced these results. These are the consequences. But then, I want you to notice as I get through the presentation that Jane began to work with the law of her body, started to follow the process of the law, and her life changed in a very short time. All right, here is Jane Chapman. I'm Jane Chapman, and not too long ago, finally got some x-rays of the hips and back. Severe bilateral osteoarthritis of the hips, and actually I'm scheduled for two hip replacements. That's bone on bone. It's the grinding of the joints. My stability is scary. I hold on to the walls if I'm at home. I've been told to use a walker. I'm only 61. This is not how you're supposed to live when you're this old. I have a really hard time believing that uh, that's all that's left. Do you hear the pathos? Do you hear pain? Do you hear her confusion? I'm 61. Is this all that's left? Do you ever think that? Is this all that's left? All I have to look forward to is when I step out of bed, I go, ouch, that's an ache, right? Or when you get down to tie your shoes, you try to find other things to do while you're down there. Is anyone listening to me? Is that all that's left? The science has shown, the research has shown, that if you are 60 years of age, if you begin to follow, last night I spoke of five things, not even the 10 that you see here, five, how it increases a woman's life and longevity. How many years? Anybody remember? Who was paying attention? How many years for a woman who follows the five things that I mentioned last night, how many years did it increase the life of that woman? Thank you for showing me that you're not paying attention. <laughs> 14 years. 14 years. All right, <clears throat> I'm giving you one more chance. One more chance. What were the five things? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. What was that? Maintaining an ideal weight. That's what the Harvard University study showed. Those five things. Just those five things. 14 additional years for women. How many years for men? I don't want to hear from the women. I want to hear a man say it. Who was it? How many? Mm, 
you've been like, you know, you really have to pay attention because you're recording this whole thing. I'm going to accept it. You represent all the men. I'll, re I'll accept it. Who said 12? You said 12? Glory, hallelujah. I'm excited. Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm happy you said it, but I wanted one of the ones down here. You're really paying attention because you have to. What did you say? How young are you, sir? Please stand up. Please turn around. He knows what I'm talking about. Here's evidence. I love, absolutely love, when there's evidence to what I'm saying sitting right in the audience. This man knows what I'm talking about, too. And how, how old are you again? You're 86. You've got a few years over this young guy over here. Hundred. That's a centenarian, you know. He's 80, and he wants he. He kind of shows off. He's got his sneakers on ready for anything. Look at him. Stand up, will you? Stand up. He's going to the gym next. 80 years of age. And these people have a testimony of what we're talking about. How's your heart? How's your heart? <laughs> Just the answer I wanted. Okay. Here's some heart facts for you. Here's some heart facts. Now, this thing that we call the heart, it is relentless. It will beat for you for years and years and years, hundreds of thousands of times per day. It is amazing. It is producing quarts, gallons really, of blood every, I mean, it's amazing in its capacity. It has its own electrical source plugged into nothing, right? That in and of itself is fascinating to me, that the human heart has this capacity to have an electrical current. It's a low one, but nonetheless, you're not plugged into anything. Now, they notice the beating of the heart right around four weeks in a fetus. Yeah, there it is. See that? Starts to beat right around four weeks, right? That heart starts to beat. And they looked, and I started to just get all these, collecting these different types of facts about the heart. Smallest heart you'll find in a hummingbird, right? Largest heart. And by the way, a hummingbird has like, I don't even, I can't remember how many heartbeats a second. Multiple, right? Largest heart. The largest heart is a blue whale about the size of a golf cart, golf cart, right? And they said that according to the uh, Mayo Clinic, they looked at the book of Daniel, and they saw that a plant-based diet is probably the first, or Daniel is probably the first line of research that shows the benefits of a plant-based diet on the heart in the book of Daniel. Exercise is one of the best ways to have a healthy heart, and how much does exercise cost? Free. Now, in 1923, there was a race that took place, horse race. And this guy actually won the race, but he suffered a heart attack as he crossed the finish line. Frank Hayes, rest in peace. Moral of the story, don't let your horse be healthier than you. <laughs> Follow me? Now, as I mentioned to you, Heart disease, number one killer, cancer right behind it. Respiratory disease follows that. Here's some stats. United States, someone has a heart attack every 43 seconds. So the time that I've been talking, just calculate the number of heart attacks that have taken place. Each minute someone in the United States dies from a heart attack or heart-related incident. Every year, about 70, 735,000 Americans have a heart attack. Here's the thing that really struck me. Of these 525,000 are a first heart attack, but 210 happen in people who have already had a heart attack. Now, I need for you to explain to me how is it that you have people who suffer one heart attack and then half of them almost have a second heart attack? Something doesn't change. 
Is that right? The problem is I, my heart's desire is the desire that the scriptures give in 3 John 2, which I mentioned in the message today, where John says, I wish above all things, beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So God's desire is that we would be healthy, that we would understand these laws, right? Because to actually have a heart attack is one thing, but to have a second one is absolutely an egregious thing to happen. Now, in 1953, Scientific Research Journal of the American Medical Association, they looked at 300 autopsies. Average age 22, 77% had evidence of coronary atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, right? How many, what percentage? Now, I, you, you guys, you know, I don't really like to use stats. I like to really kind of make things a little simpler and practical for people. But at the same time, when I give a stat, I'm giving a stat for a reason. And I don't want you to skip over the statistic. What is it that you see in that statistic that is particularly important to look at. Were you about to say something? Yes. 22 years of age. That's the thing. 22 years of age. You remember 22? You were invincible. Did whatever you want, stayed up as late as you want, ate whatever you wanted. There was really no consequences. But they looked at autopsies, people who had died different types of casualties, you know, car wreck or something like that. And they looked at the arteries, and they saw they already had signs of heart disease. And not a small percentage of them. 77% is a very large number. That's more than three-quarters of those they looked at. Then they looked, American Heart Journal, they looked at these accidental deaths as well, between ages of 3 and 26, found first stage of atherosclerosis, that's the fatty streaks, found in nearly all American children by what age? Now, that's worse. Worse. That was from what they looked at in 1981. 1953, 1981. 1953, 1981. What's taking place? We're getting better, right? getting worse. We're not getting better, right? We're not getting better. So what's clear is that if somehow society and health, public health is not teaching us how to actually avoid heart attacks and heart disease in a way that's really making a dent, then what needs to take place? You need to start to understand this on the level that we're sharing and begin to embrace it to have the success of my friends here and then share it with others. See, I got passionate about this because my mother, as I mentioned last night, she had triple bypass heart surgery at the age of 55. I'm 54. Now, here's what I could do. I could say, you know what? Genetically, I'm predisposed. I could say that, couldn't I? In fact, doctors would want to look at my family history, and they would say, well, did your mother have a heart attack? Did she have heart disease? You know, well, you, chances are it increases your risk, right? And they would be correct. Exactly, see? But what they don't tell you, if you eat the way mama did, the risk goes up even more. So I don't eat like mama did. I don't eat like mama did. And I went, to the, I went to the doctor, to a cardiologist, and I got the whole battery of tests. He said, and, and, and I wanted to do it because I, you know, I wanted to know, you know. I was thinking about the age of my mother when things kind of went downhill for her, and I was getting close to that age. So I said, maybe I should go check it out, right? Even though I'm going around, I'm giving health talks and health lectures and all that, sh clearly, surely, you must have a healthy heart. Well, I didn't want to take any chances. So I went, and the, I'll never forget what the doctor said to me. 
He came back, he looked at me, and I did this calcium score, I did the stress test, I did all the blood work and all that. He just looked at me, and he was quite frustrated. He said, why are you here? That's what he said to me. Well, I didn't appreciate that. I'm like, what do you mean, why am I here? Am I not paying you? In other words, he was saying I was wasting his time. But it wasn't a waste of time for me because we ought to know and we should take control of our health. Is this making sense to you? Because there's something that's happening among us and we need to make sure that we're informed and that we are being CEOs, as I like to say, chief executive organisms of our own bodies. Be a good CEO of your own health. Now, Dr. Michael Greco, who wrote the book, How Not to Die, and he gives all a host of examples of what not to die from, including heart disease. He says the question isn't whether or not you want to eat healthier to prevent heart disease, but whether or not you want to reverse the heart disease that you already have. And based on the research that I just shared with you, more than likely, people already have heart disease and don't know it. So it's better to A, find out where you are, and B, to actually begin to follow the laws of your body. We'll get into that some more in just a little bit. Now, Cardiac Cafe. Listen to this. I found, I found this fascinating. I had to go extract it from a presentation just to show you. Hear the statistics. This is like fresh information. Over 17 million people die every year from cardiovascular disease. It is the leading cause of death around the world. Nearly one out of every three people will die from this disease. The amount of people who die from cardiovascular disease is the equivalent of four jumbo jets crashing every single hour, every single day, every single year. Did you hear that? How many jumbo jets? Crashing how often? Every single hour of every single day of every single year. Now, I like the way that that puts that so into perspective because sometimes we say this number and that number. Could you imagine if that took place every hour? Oh, yeah, we become desensitized and say, oh, yeah, yeah. Another four jets just came out of the sky. Oh, there are four more. But that's how we think about heart disease and how often people die of it. Huh, yeah. This is that. Now, there's something in this little clip that I think is very important. And I want you to really, if you were sleepy before, just kind of shake it off. In fact, you know what? Stand up, stand up. Because I don't want you to miss this. Stand up, stand up. Stand up. There you go. Just shake, shake your limbs. Get that blood. There you go. Recirculate that blood, right? right? Lift up a leg, shake it. Take the other one, shake it. Put your right arm out. Put your left arm out. <laughs> sit down, sit down. <laughs> shake it all about. I want you to listen to this, and I want you to capture what Sanjay Gupta, you know he's from CNN, this was a CNN report, and it was, on, it was a report on Bill Clinton. Anybody remember him? Bill Clinton was someone who, he was someone who, I, many people thought he was our healthiest president. Remember that? Because every time you saw him early mornings, they would show him doing what? You remember that? He would be jogging. What they didn't realize, he was often jogging to McDonald's. Now, that's not a joke. That's not a joke. He himself said, I dr truly enjoyed the quarter pounder with cheese and an apple pie. That's what he would have. And here was the result of that diet. I spent time with him and saw that he looked tired, not himself. Got all pale and weak. And then... Uh... I got all these letters from the, you know, the doctor crowd saying, yeah, it's normal because fools like you won't do what you're supposed to do because you don't eat like you should, you don't exercise like you should. The doctor said it was a mechanical failure of the bypass. 
and he needed stents to open the blocked artery. You know that calcium buildup? So lucky they were able to put those two stents in, you know, and, and fix an artery that had been, it was pretty bent and ugly. The goal of Listen. the treatment, and I think it will be achieved, is for President Clinton to resume his uh, very active lifestyle. Uh, this was not a result of um, either his lifestyle or his diet, which have been excellent. But Dr. Dean Ornish didn't see it that way. And so I wrote him a letter and I said, you know, the friends that mean the most to me are the ones that tell me what I need to hear, not necessarily what I want to hear. And you need to know that your genes are not your fate. That, and I say this not to blame you, but to empower you. And I'm happy to work with you to whatever extent you, you want to move forward in that way. And we met a few days later and he said he was ready to do it. I essentially concluded that I had just played Russian roulette because even though I had changed my diet some and cut down on the caloric total of my ingestion and cut back on how much of the high cholesterol food I was eating, I still, without any scientific basis to support what I did, was taking in a lot of extra cholesterol without knowing whether my body would produce enough of the enzyme to dispose of it. And clearly it didn't, or I wouldn't have had that blockage. So that's when I made a decision to really change. I should have done it after the surgery. Coming up, prep. Okay, what'd you hear? This is very important. This is like the critical point. Ah. Uh -huh. Do you think he was lying? Do you think it was a lie? He was what? I think because we don't know, I think it's safer to say that he was ignorant. Now, do you know, and I'm going to show you in just a couple of minutes, that doctors don't necessarily get nutritional courses for them to know this information. That's not a criticism. That's just a fact of life, right? So this doctor was speaking from an absence of information or knowledge, not that he was necessarily being deceitful. I'd rather look at it that way. You all are with me? But nonetheless, on national television, he poisoned the minds of many people. When he said, wasn't his diet, wasn't his lifestyle. Right? So many people... Be, join the number of the ranks of people who would have a heart attack and then would do what? Have a second heart attack because they didn't know any better, right? Now, in addition to that, you heard, just to look at the process, he had heart disease. You saw the buildup that I've been explaining to you. You saw it in animation and how it was building up and it was closing. That's called occlusion when the artery is starting to close up. And you don't want it to be in a certain area of the, of the heart. They call that a widowmaker. This, the actual name, widowmaker. Now, he was having the clogging of his arteries. He then, what they showed was a stent. And on our television show, we actually show how a stent works. They put it in and then they basically blow it up and then it opens up the arteries so that there can be a free flow of blood, right? Well, to your point, he should have made the total change at that time, but he didn't. And guess what happened to even the arteries where the two stents were? They started to close right back up. Why did they close back up? Let me see if you've been paying attention. Why did they close back up? But, but what? I want to be very specific. Calcium and fat, cholesterol, which is the precursor to all of the issues with atherosclerosis, right? Fatty streaks. So he continued. Now, let me ask you a question. Let me reverse this on you just a little bit. What if he just had a nice kale salad? with little cranberries in there, you know, not with the high-fat ranch dressing or the, not the blue cheese dressing, but just nice, you know, no, I'm not going to do vinegar, but, but I, won't, I won't get into why not right now, 
What if, what if he just had like a nice, some lemon juice and maybe a little olive oil, some olives on there? Would those arteries have closed up again? So the problem was he went back to transgressing the what? The law. And when you transgress the law, the body does what? There's a consequence. And the consequence tells you you're breaking the law. So what do you do with that? What do you do with that? When the body, the law of love tells you you're messing up again, you do what? How do you fix it? You start to cooperate with the law of love that desires to keep you alive. I hope that makes sense to you. Uh, have we lost connection here? Ah, there we go. Now. Yeah. I spent. Yeah. Okay. When yeah. we speak of heart disease, I would say the role of alcohol is pretty small. The role of sugar is very small, too. Smoking is big, but the good news is that most people have quit or, or never did smoke. The problem with animal-based diet, its contribution to heart disease is huge, and it is pervasive. All this expensive imaging, procedures, bypasses, medication, none of which has one solitary single thing to do with the causation of the illness. So you die of a completely benign, foodborne illness that never had its causation treated. When we eat these kind of dead meat bacteria toxins, within minutes, you get this burst of inflammation within your system such that you basically paralyze your arteries. You get this stiffening of the arteries, their inability to relax normally in half. So it's not like decades down the road eating unhealthy, there'll be some damage. No, we're talking damage right then and there within minutes of it going into our mouth. Many people are given the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease when it's not true Alzheimer's at all. The vast majority of people suffer dementia due to their tiny blood vessels in their brain clogging up and their nerve cells being shortchanged of oxygenated blood. And guess where that blood vessel dementia comes from? Those little tiny arteries are clogging up from that steady stream of bad cholesterol, etc. It's really quite clear from the standpoint of cancer and the standpoint of cardiovascular disease, that animal protein plays an enormous role. Is chicken better? It's a question of whether you want to be shot or hung. <laughs> shot or hung or hanged. <laughs> that really does make it very simple and practical, and I like to do that. But the idea, just to kind of give some origins and to wrap this one up, um, I wanted to know, where did this whole idea of heart disease come from? When did it start? I mean, is this something that is, is a more recent phenomenon? Is this something that we started to experience when we uh, moved away from being an agrarian society, meaning that we were living off the land and having, you know, growing our peas and our cabbage and our different fruits and vegetables right there on our own land? Uh, is, is it, did it come as a result of McDonald's and and Burger King and Kentucky Fried Chicken in the 50s when we moved to fast food. All these things did play a result. And of course, the research shows that once fast food came onto the scene, um, cardiovascular disease increased by 35%, right? So there was uh, a correlation there. But notice something with me. They looked at mummies, mummies that were from the exhumed bodies of Egyptians. Do you know what the average lifespan was for an Egyptian? What was that? You're about right. 30, 35, maybe tops 40 years of age. They had a very short lifespan. And they looked at the diseases that they suffered. Of course, I think it's a wonderful thing that God designed was the science that they had of how to preserve bodies because in 2018, we have the ability with the, the kind of uh, state-of-the-art technology that we have, we can actually look into the arteries, see what they suffered from, what they died from, what is found even in their gut, 
what type of gut flora they had, whether they had good bacteria or bad bacteria, was it as a result of a high meat diet? We can know all those things by looking at those mummified Egyptians. And they found that number one, heart disease. Diabetes, cancer, gout, all lifestyle related diseases. Edema, swelling of the joints, too much fluid. And there's a whole reason in the law of the body why the fluid builds up. Trichina. Do you know what trichina is or what a trichina worm is and what it comes as a result of? It comes from eating pork. See, the law says don't eat pork. Is that in the Bible? It's in the Bible. The Bible says, don't eat the swine. The swine is an unclean animal, and that animal has been designed by God to clean up trash. In Haiti, it was amazing to watch. Haiti has no trash system to speak of. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Anybody here ever been to Haiti? Port-au-Prince, do they have a trash system? They have one river, they call it the Trash River, the river of trash. And it, all there is there is trash. No pickup, no recycling. It's all just mounds and mounds of trash everywhere. They burn it. So everything. I thought to myself, whenever I'm there, I think, you know, if Jesus ever came to this earth again, and it wasn't the second coming, which I don't believe he would, but I'm just saying if he did, he would go to Haiti because it just looks like and reminds me of what it must have been like in Jerusalem when he came. Always trash burning, Gehenna, the eternal place of burning trash. Animals are being, you see the animals on the side of the road being, you know, the poverty, the level of demon possession, but the smell but it was interesting. What they eat there and all of that is just amazing. But this whole idea of the trichina worm, how God said, don't eat the pig. That's the law. That's the law of the body. If you should happen to eat it, you eat these things that only are here to eat trash and waste. That's all they do. If you eat them, you get their poison and their toxins. And they are perfectly fine. A snake can bite a pig, and the pig will skip on down the road. Will not be affected by it. Now, that should tell you something. They have no sweat glands. They have none. So oftentimes, their bodies just burst open with ulcers, and they ooze out stuff. So... You're not even supposed to touch him, really. Trichina worm. There's one case, or multiple cases, really, in um, Phoenix, Arizona, where this woman thought she had a brain tumor, and they went in to remove the brain tumor. Not a brain tumor at all. It was a trichina worm because she had eaten some pork. And can you imagine that? That which was hardly visible under a microscope entered in through her mouth into her gut, got into the bloodstream, absorbed into the small intestines, went into the bloodstream, and then made its way up to the brain. And by the time they removed it, it was the size of a finger. What was its diet? Brain matter. They were able to see even this affected the Egyptians. Might this be one of the reasons that they have a shorter lifespan? Absolutely. Now, here's some of the, here's some of the deception. This seems like just complete deception. This, this was an AP article that ran a few years ago. And I'm going to just read this to you. Even without modern-day temptations like fast food or cigarettes, people had clogged arteries some 4,000 years ago according to the biggest ever hunt for the condition in mummies. Now, they did the same thing that everyone does in, in terms of scientific research. They look at the mummies. 
researchers suggest that heart disease may be more a natural part of human aging rather than being directly tied to contemporary risk factors like smoking, eating fatty foods, and not exercising. Do you believe that? This is scientific research. This was put out on AP. That means it went around the world and teaching people that heart disease is not something that comes as a result of not following the laws. It comes as a result of the fact that you just are getting older. Even though they find certain people groups that they don't, like the Japanese, they don't have the issue that we have. They less. Heart disease has been stalking. Boy, I put that word in red. Do you know why? Stalking. Because the imagery that it conjures up in the mind. That means that heart disease is hiding, stalking like an animal. An animal that is a predator. We're talking predation here. Something that's hiding behind your kitchen refrigerator, waiting for you to walk by, and jumps on you. There's your heart attack. Heart disease has been stalking mankind for 4,000 years all over the globe, said Dr. Randall Thompson, the lead researcher in this study. What do you make of that? Run on AP, placed in journals. Thompson said he was surprised to see heart and arteries even in people like the ancient Aleutians who were presumed to have a, now watch this, healthy lifestyle as... What were they? What is a hunter-gatherer? <laughs> you know what's funny to me? Hunter-gatherers, is a, it's, it's, it's a class or a specification of how people lived and what they ate. Them. But you know, the hunters were the... Help me out here. What gender were they? And the gatherers were the... Usually the women. So we see a correlation there that, as, as I shared with you last night, who lives longer? The women, right? The women. Just a thought. So they were hunting and gathering. So if they were hunting, they were getting meat from animals and they were consuming that meat and they would have heart disease. I think it's fair to say people should feel less guilty about getting heart disease in modern times. Don't feel guilty about your heart disease. Enjoy it. Embrace it. It's okay. Your arteries are clogged up. It's not, you can, come on, is this your fate? It's your culture. We may have oversold the idea, idea that a healthy lifestyle can completely eliminate your risk. Now, I'm being facetious, and I hope you pick that, pick that up. This is a travesty. This is an absolute travesty. Now, I'm only pointing out here, I love this this, the fact that tomatoes have something in it, um, those seeds. Remember I talked about the seeds. This guy talks about seeds a lot. Well, the seeds, um, actually, according to this research, tomatoes are protective against heart attacks. See how the law of God is protective. Protects against heart attacks. One of the reasons is because of the yellow fluid which surrounds the seeds. God bless you, sister. Thank you so much. You hear my dry throat. The fluid concentrates a compound that suppresses platelet act activation, which is a thing that is a precursor to the heart attacks in the first place. Right? So, make sure when you make that wonderful salad with those salad tomatoes full of lycopene that you make use of those seeds. Okay, let's close with this. What's the problem? What is the problem? Well, medical schools offer a single, offering a single course in nutrition is down by how much? 37%. Is that a good thing? So if it suggests that it's down, and this is recent research, fairly recent, if it's down, that suggests that it's going in what way? What's the trajectory? What's the trend? So, there, so even though you had a doctor stand on, on national television, say to the entire world that Bill Clinton suffered the issues that he had, but it was not a result of his diet. At that point, you would think, wait a minute, another doctor comes along, shows that to be completely false, writes an entire book about reversing heart disease, and even looked at the 
the results or the benefits of a plant-based diet on prostate cancer in men and how that could be reversed. And yet, the trend is that it's going down. Please, someone explain that to me. You see why we need to understand it from God's perspective and not man's? Here's another little stat. One study concluded that people on the streets knew more about nutrition than doctors. Now, that is not something that's just someone said, let's, you know, let's show how doctors don't know what they're talking about. No, they wanted to know, and it's an actual study that they did. And I think that was back in a few years ago in, 90, in the 90s. But they talked to people on the street, and they wanted to know. They asked questions like, what's an antioxidant? What are phenols? What are the things that are chemical compounds that are found in fruits and vegetables that are healthy for you? What foods actually um, are linked to disease and which ones actually help to reverse diseases? And they found that the people who were on the, treat, on the streets knew more than the doctors. How about this? Bill was introduced by the California Leg State Legislature to mandate nutritional education for physicians. It was killed by the California Medical Association. I always like to give this one in California because it's talking about the experience right here in your state. So in other words, they were like, someone introduced a bill and said, hey, it would be a good idea if these doctors start to learn a little bit about nutrition so that when their patients come in and they have lifestyle diseases, that they can give them or suggest something other than a drug. Right? Well, somebody didn't think that was a good idea. In fact... The mandate was for at least 12 hours of nutrition training anytime over the next four years. The California, thank you ter very much, Terry. I appreciate that. The CMA, California Medical Association, opposed it along with the California Academy of Family Physicians. The bill was amended from a mandatory minimum of 12, and it got dropped down to seven hours. And then it was killed altogether, and they require no hours whatsoever. You begin to see the correlation. You begin to see why, right? It's almost as if that there is a plan. Keep you sick. It's good for business. It's very good for business. Okay. <laughs> Some say he's got one in Washington. All right. From. I wanted to follow up with Gene. I want to close with this. The follow up with Gene. Now I could show you the the the, the piece from my show where they looked at the the different vials and saw the amount of fat. But I think you guys have really get, gotten the point. But I want to show you Jane Jane Chapman. They followed up with her. You you ready to see the miracle in closing? Watch this. Look I wanted to follow up with Jane Chapman, who had been suffering from severe osteoarthritis, and I could not believe what I saw after only a few weeks of fasting and changing her diet. So those are so amazing. See, like, this one, a few weeks later. I know. From going from the walker, needing wheelchair assistance at the airport, to strolling down the street, enjoying the fresh air, the sunshine. Two weeks. It's all it took, two weeks, to get off all the meds and uh, start to, to feel the inflammation just kind of drain out of the body, where the movement was much easier. Uh, just a lot of healing occurred very, very rapidly just by doing the right things for your body. I love her final statement. Doing the right things for the body. What are the right things? The things according to the design of the body. The right things are following the natural order of the body. The right things are doing what the law requires. In short, what God has designed goes into the body and it adds life to you. Nuts, two years. Eating nuts every day adds two years. Eating vegetables, green leafy vegetables, adds life, years to the body. Meat, 
reduces life. But that's the Bible, isn't it? In my conversation over lunch, the question was raised, well, why does the Bible also say, well, you can eat the clean animals. It's okay to eat them, you know. Certain ones, it's very specific, too. It tells you which ones to eat, which ones not to eat. It's either clean or unclean. How many of the clean went onto the boat? Seven by seven. And the unclean? Two by two. So the Bible does say to eat the clean ones, but what I would give you as your own personal research, if you're not clear on it, go and look at Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, and begin there. Genesis chapter 9, God says specifically these words. You may eat the animals of the earth. I'm paraphrasing. You may eat them, but from their life, I will require your life. When it says require, your life will be required. That means, it doesn't mean he's going to come and take your life. It just means that the natural consequence of eating them, it will shorten your life. Now, if you just took that and you juxtaposed it, aligned it with the research that we see today, eating meat shortens your life. Who was telling the truth in the beginning? God was. May this bless you, and I thank you. I think we will take a break.